Hello, I'm Autumn Gerald Arkapa, and you're listening to the Cinematography Podcast. The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft, and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hello, Mr. Rock. How's it going, Senior Friedman? I'm doing okay. Hey, we've got a great episode of uh, the Cinematography Podcast coming up right now. Uh, we've got Autumn Derald Arkapa, ASC, on the show. She has a little movie out at the theater right now called Black Panther 2. You might have heard of it. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> little number one movie uh two weeks in a row we've had a lot of number one movie people actually i think it's three weeks now uh yeah they they basically kicked serious but i think i saw they're up to like 675 million worldwide something like nice. that so yeah really impressive so ben a lot of stuff going on in the sort of entertainment world right now a lot of news a lot of stories you might not have known this but disney had a uh a movie come out over thanksgiving called strange world it was animated it, it was oh I you saw, saw it, it in the theater yeah yeah well huh. uh i have a four and a half year old so uh those are the kinds of movies we go see now it's getting pretty universally panned, uh, did not doing too well. And the, the estimates are that it could be as much as a hundred million dollar loss for Disney. Oof. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say, I liked it. I thought it was pretty good. Cool. Look, right, cool. Well. I thought it looked great. I thought the voice cast was amazing. My heart goes out to them because they're being uh, accused of feeding people woke ideas in that there's a gay character, a teen gay boy. And it's not even like that much attention was drawn to it. It was just kind of there. And there was a, maybe an, an overriding environmental message that I don't personally disagree with. But moreover, I just thought it looked really cool and it was fun. Yeah, what do you do? It- no, that's well. Hey, that's great. I'm looking forward then to seeing it. I got to say that Disney does pretty darn well with their animated films, even ones that get released at, at weird times. Like, you know, Encanto was one of those movies and stuff. Where at first, it didn't look like it was going to do particularly well, but then uh, it really got legs, especially mm-hmm. once it came to streaming. But yeah, Disney's been somewhat troubled. They they just in the last couple of weeks or so now they've fired their CEO, uh, That's Bob crazy. JPEG, which is funny because uh, you go back just a few months before that, six months ago, he was his contract was renewed for like till 2025. I don't know what the payout's going to be to him for firing him after renewing, but I have to imagine that problems they've felt were so great that they're willing to pay whatever sort of fees uh, go along with that. That's pretty major. But uh, Bob Iger is back. Of course, you know, famed head of Disney for for so many years. Yeah, he was there for a long time. Did he follow Michael Eisner directly or was there someone between him and Michael? Yeah, well, he was there, uh, you know, he was sort of groomed to take over and and such. But I think there may have actually been someone else in there. But regardless, Iger has been sort of like, you know, a hand on the helm for a long time. So Bob Chapek's sort of like getting uh, there's a lot of articles being written right now about like, what did he do? You know, Wall Street's expectations of him. Uh, Theme park business was up. Movie business was down. It's interesting to see, uh, you know, where the dust settles and what finally comes out in the wash, but uh, Iger's back. Well, uh, the, you kind of go like, like how much of what's happened at Disney over the last, whatever, two, three years could even be his fault. Like there was a whole global pandemic and he had true. to close. Like he had to make some horrible choices and he's been uh, battling very publicly with the governor of Florida, uh, Ron DeSantis, which is oh, sure. where a lot of their money's coming out of because they've got all of the Magic Kingdom there in Orlando. Something tells me that Bob Chapek's going to be just fine, though. You know, all said and done. You know? uh, I'm not worried about him. No, no. I, th- I think he'll. Uh, I think he'll land on his feet somewhere. Hey, uh, we also got to talk about everything, everywhere, all at once. Uh, is doing really well right now. Uh, uh, at the that's Gotham- so cool. Yeah, at the Gotham and, and, and anyone listening yeah. to this, go back and listen to our interview with Larkin Seipel, the DP of Everything Everywhere All at Once. Like I am, I'm rooting so hard for this movie to get all the nominations, you know, for uh, the Oscars, and well, uh, you know, pick well, up a few of, a, of the gold statues. It's doing well on its way there. It got eight Independent Spirit Awards, and of course, the Gotham Awards, which are directly uh, related to and come out of the IFP, which of course, Film Independent and the Independent Spirit. It won Best Feature at the the Gotham Awards. To Today. So that is a uh, high praise for them. That's a lot happening. And that, that's, and that, that does amazing. bode well for their, their Oscar run. 
the odds are always against any movie that comes out that early in the year getting a lot of Oscar love. It does happen. So I just think that that movie is just such a special movie. It's a movie that I think people are going to be referring to for decades to come. It, you know, it's groundbreaking and interesting in so many ways in the way it chooses to tell its story. And, you know, the Daniels are so freaking talented and Larkin is so unbelievably talented. I just I want to see it raised up in stature like we're in this moment right now where all these great movies are coming out i just watched uh the banshees of irish uh, in banshees of what? yeah in Asheran, my brain wouldn't give it to me yeah. you can leave it like that ben Katz. i'll sound like an idiot it's fine banshees uh. of in Asheran. i watched it on a screener last week beautiful movie brilliant movie like we're about to see a lot of those i haven't seen the fablemans yet looking forward to that there's so many great movies coming out but i i really for me the movie to beat this year is everything everywhere all at once yeah, for sure. Uh, that's going to be a strong contender for sure. And we're heading into the Oscar season. So all those movies are going to start popping up. Yep. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm excited to see them. And uh, c- can I complain about screeners for a second? Uh, sure. If but, there was well, one. I mean, I mean, this is like serious first world problems, but I'm okay. in the director's guild and I would say 80 percent of the sc- first of all, why are we still getting screeners on DVD? Mm. Whatever. Secondly, why do Amazon and Netflix send out so many screeners? Like, yeah. we all have Prime <laughs> and Netflix. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know what they're thinking. Maybe you need that extra copy for your, I, I don't know, yacht in the South Seas or something. That extra right? copy for me to like look at and be like, do I sh- how do I shred this again? How do I get rid of this so that in a proper way? Ugh. <laughs> Uh, but, yeah, uh, and I got to say, finally, I think some of the streaming screeners are better. They used to be super compressed that you couldn't even really see like some of the stuff that was going on. It was so terrible. So anyway, well, there there was a service that that I'm not I'm not getting this this service this year, but last year the DGA was using a thing called Screener Passport, mm, and yeah. I thought the stuff looked it was at least HD and it wasn't overly compressed, and it looked uh, if I would get that and I would get a screener, I would always watch Screener Passport. Uh, I will say that they're much better, but sometimes they would just take the super uber compressed uh, crappy DVDs and then put them on the streaming service and then you'd watch the crappy DVD quality and then it was it was no better. But regardless, this is first world problems. And thank you for alienating like, you know, uh, all the, the people <laughs> in, our, in our, our listeners right now who are like, well, listen to you fuckos complaining about yeah. you know, <laughs> the quality of your screeners. Yeah. So it's like I just wish the Banshees of Inna Sharon would come to my city. <laughs> Oh, no. I had to go watch Banshees in a theater. And let me tell you, that was the way to see it. It was awesome. Oh, I believe it. I'm sorry that you uh, had to watch it on a screener. (laughs) Well, just having a four-year-old kid, it's like uh, screeners are how I'm going to see a lot of stuff, unfortunately. But anyway. Anyway. So, hey, why don't we get to the interview with Autumn Derald Arkapa? Here we go. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. Joining me now is the cinematographer of the number one movie in America right now, and probably in much of the world, uh, Wakanda Forever, the new Black Panther movie, is cinematographer Autumn Derald Arkapa. Thanks so much for being on the Cinematography Podcast. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's just a little movie, right? It's just a little tiny. No, no, of course, of course, I'm kidding. This, this is a massive, massive undertaking, which I know got tons of cover in the trades for like uh, being shut down at a certain point because of injuries and it made it to theaters on time. Tell us a little bit about the massive undertaking, which is Black Panther 2. Yeah, I was fortunate enough to do a project with Marvel prior to this one, Loki, and I had such a great experience. You know, it was probably my biggest film to date for sure. So it was something that I was excited about, but I think all the pieces of the puzzle came together and we had such a great team on that one. We were Mm -hmm. creating this new world for Marvel because it was the first time they were doing the streaming series. And what was so great about that is that we were, we got to explore, right? And we did a lot of things that were new for the first time. And uh, I got to work with, you know, amazing SFX team and VFX team. So I already had some kind of groundwork there laid for how the Marvel process is, but just the support that you have and how expansive that support is. So in going to Panther, I was really excited to work with Ryan. Obviously, um, that was something that was most important to me. And when we, you know, united and then I had a call with him, it just felt like working with family. You know, it was very familiar. We're also from the Bay Area and I was very lucky to have this come my way and, you know, and have had that experience, but then also being able to explore this new world, you know, because this time around, it's much different. 
um, unfortunately, because of the loss of Chadwick. So um, yeah, I, I felt honored, but I also felt like the timing was perfect for me as well. Uh, this is your first collaboration with uh, Ryan Coogler. And tell me about that process. How, did Marvel make the introduction? How did this process come about? Did Victoria Alonso pick up the phone and just say, hey, uh, Autumn, I-, I want you to meet someone. H- how did it go? Yeah. Um, no, funny you mentioned Victoria because she was also part of it. I, you know, I'm good friends with Rachel Morrison. We both went to AFI and we've been friends for years. And I knew she was struggling with kind of figuring out her schedule um, to make this work because she's now directing. So she gave me a heads up and mentioned, you know, I'm not going to be able to do it, but Ryan's interested in speaking with you. So we had never met. I had seen Ryan once out somewhere, I think in public and knew who he was, but we had never met officially. So we had our official meeting on Zoom and we just got to know each other. I mean, you know, we knew of each other. We had very, uh, very close mutual friends. You know, a lot of things had to happen to get us to finally meet. And he's just so special to me now. We're very close friends. I consider him family. I love his family. He's a beautiful family. And he's a good person. So we met and we had a Zoom and got along really well and kind of just hit the ground running. You know, I, had, I was still on Loki, finishing that up. And I had a little bit of a break and then obviously went back home. And then he brought me on to do non-consecutive prep was the first time we started talking about it because, you know, he's just one of those guys, I think, which is so collaborative and great that he's bringing me on a little bit earlier than I'm on the ground to talk about, talk through stuff and be a part of his boarding and previous. Yeah. So when you've got a giant project like this and there, there's a lot of hands, there's a lot of people who have some sort of input or say into everything that's going on in the, in the production, not necessarily just the creatives, but I've heard in particular that Marvel is very, very supportive of their directors, of their cinematographers, of the vision that they have going forward. When you started visualizing the story, how much of your framing, of your lighting, you think comes through in the final? Is it 100%? Is it 98%? How much is, of it is you and how how much do you feel like is is committee that, that comes in? Yeah, I mean, I think it's an interesting question to ask because I've only had an experience in Loki and this one now where everything that you're bringing to the table is supported. Um, the director and I are on the same page visually. I never felt like I was doing things by committee or anything. I mean, when I say not doing things by a committee, it's a huge group of people making this film. But as far as is your idea supported, do I feel like those are my images that I helped create with others? Yes, I do. And I think why maybe some people don't don't get to answer that question like that is because maybe they're not so much a part of the VFX of these types of films. But I made it a point to kind of want to be involved. But also that team allowed me to be involved. Um, Early on, Jeff and I had a uh, call. And he introduced himself to me when he knew I was going to be on the project. And he's just so lovely, Jeff Bauman, the uh, VFX supervisor. And he also worked on the first one. And, um, you know, we just got to know each other. And it was like, okay, what are we going to do? How can I support you? How can I make this experience great? Like, how can we make an amazing film? And so that was always the thing. It was like, let's let's do this together because the VFX is an extension of our photography on set. So it all should feel like one vision. Ryan and I's vision, and we should all be helping each other to make it the best it can be. So that's kind of my answer to that. But I I only felt like I feel very personal about the images out there. So even the VFX ones, I, I feel personal. I think that's a great answer. And tell us a little bit more about the collaboration with with VFX. It sounds like you're in from conception. You're in from like, you know, the the early days of that process. What is that collaboration like on on a day-to-day basis in, you know, pre-production, production, production, post-production? Yeah. I mean, you know, we have so much to do and there's always not enough time, right? And think about- Films aren't finished, they're abandoned. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's mostly like, you know, because the script was so full, right? You see this movie, you see how much we have to do and in introducing this new world. And it was very important to Ryan to make it as feel as real as possible and grounded and relatable. So as much as we can put on set, you know, Hannah's great and all of her sets um, are so bold and big and expansive. And she's so great at giving me ceilings because she knows I like ceilings. And that's also helpful for VFX, right? Putting as much as you can in camera and being able to ground the VFX in something is important. So from day one, it's these conversations are being had. We go over our previs and it doesn't matter that you're on a Marvel film and there is a lot of the effects. Like there's still a way to do something to make it feel as real as possible and to do 
all you can um, on set. So as far as like from the start, I'm talking to VFX about the underwater world. We're doing testing and prep. So you, you bring up the underwater sequences, uh, of which there are many in this movie. Clearly, you didn't have massive casts of people all underwater. Uh, how is it for you to, to do this? I, I mean, how much of it is in the can, so to speak, and how much of this is being created in the computer? Would you say that it's very seamless the way it blends, but I have to imagine that the coordination of that to actually try to do something uh, practically would be impossible. So can you talk about the process of some of the most dynamic and difficult uh, sequences of, of the movie? Yeah. I mean, the thing about it, it's like, you know, we all have a reference for what underwater looks like, right? You know, some people have gone, you know, deep sea diving. Some people just swim in the ocean in different parts of the world. Your pool. We all know that the clarity down there isn't the best. Uh, we know how things move and look. You know, color's different. Light is different. You know, when you see a movie underwater where everything is sharp and you can see miles away, people are moving differently. It doesn't, it bumps, right? You're like, wait a second, that's fake. So with all that in mind, we're approaching it like, how can we make this underwater stuff as believable as possible so that the physical and like the optical attributes of what we're doing uh, feel real? So that's kind of our approach from the beginning. So we did as much work in prep as we could uh, in a tank and underwater. So that was the agenda, right? It was important to Ryan and important to VFX and myself and Hannah and also Ruth that we can put as much as we can in the water to see how it reacts to photograph it, to learn how we wanted light to look, to learn movement, color, everything, um, the refraction of light, just everything that we could. So we did this in prep and we did like a Pepsi challenge where we shot everything that we, you know, certain sequences, we, you know, earmarked a few sequences, uh, one being Namor's uh, descending onto the throne. And we shot it in water, wet for wet. And we also shot it dry for wet uh, on a stage. And then we gave those two elements to Weta to create, you know, the shot. And what's great about that is, you know, being able to give them a reference that we lit exactly the same in water and outside of water so they could use that um, to ultimately create what you've seen in the movie where he's descending. So every single shot that you see in the movie that's underwater either was really shot underwater or had some type of reference to allude to the shot that was um, ultimately created. And the thing is, it's like there's so many things that we discussed in our prep and in this testing is like the turbidity, um, which is like the clarity of the water, color absorption, magnification changes, all this stuff for learning and prep. So it advises us on how best to make this stuff look so it feels and looks real. Marine snow, you see all the particles that are in the water and the lenses that I use have amazing characteristics, um, anamorphic. We shot two times anamorphic underwater. So some of those shots where you see the marine snow you can see really interesting bouquet and um, fall off and aberrations and stuff. So it was all very important that we learn about that, right? With the lensing and all this stuff. But also, I think it's also great because it gave uh, the actors a chance to get in water, learn how to swim and move so that then when they did the dry for wet, they knew how that felt, right? Instead of just putting them in, you know, a dry environment and then asking them to act, but they experienced both. Um, so it was amazing. And you know, light behaves different underwater. So it was like trying to create this um, deep space movie that Ryan was very interested in underwater because we all know that in the depths of the sea, there's not much light until you introduce light. So I feel like we were able to, um, we were successful and that has to do with us putting in all that effort early on to try and figure it out and not just deciding to do everything dry, uh, which obviously would be easier, but it would not look as good. That's awesome. Um, let's uh, jump back to early in the career. You mentioned that you're from the Bay Area, and I happened to see, of course, uh, the, the first time you appeared on my radar was from a little film called Powell Alto. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, how that came about? How did uh, Powell Alto come, come to you? Yeah, um, I did my graduate degree at AFI, American Film Institute. Uh, one of my classmates was shooting with Gia Coppola for Palo Alto, like he was shooting these test sequences that they were showing James Franco and like, um, I want to say like a 5D or something at the time and putting together some of those little scenes with Gia's friends and then they would show Franco. And so there was one day and it was the soccer scene in the movie where the girls are playing at the soccer game and he couldn't make it. So he entered, he asked if I could be available and I did it. And I was like, of course, yeah. So I went there and I met her and we shot a little test scene, the soccer scene. 
And we just hit it off. Um, and then she ended up asking me to shoot the movie. But prior to shooting that movie, because, you know, it took a little bit to get going, I did a bunch of like little fashion films with her, you know, for different brands. Um, mm -hmm. So we really got to know each other. And we had like a little community and a producer of ours. And I had like a crew that I was using. And yeah, it always just felt like this like little squad of us, you know, young kids making films. And that's exactly how Palo Alto was shot. It was a squad of us making this non-union, very small film with my friends, Gia's friends, and some of the actors were her friends. And it was very intimate and personal. Um, so I think having that be one of my first biggest experiences that kind of set my career off made me feel good about like always working with friends or like-minded people because it is like the more family you feel on set, I think that shows in the ultimate, the work at the end of the day. For sure. And kudos to you because you just recently entered into the ASC and the time from AFI to entering the ASC, is only about 10 years. So that's got to be one of the fastest ascents that I know of anyone coming out of film school, coming out of any film program anywhere. So congratulations. You're in your uh, very rarefied company and it's been wonderful to watch your, your progress. And we're going to talk about some of the other stuff in your filmography here in just a second, particularly Loki, because I raved and gushed about Loki as my, my favorite Marvel Marvel streaming series and one of the best things I'd ever seen on television. So I just, I thought it was really, really amazing. But you did some collaboration with uh, Spike Jones. You did a, uh, I would say the definitive documentary on the Beastie Boys. Can you talk a little bit about that experience? How, how did that come about? I think Spike and I were supposed to do a music video. Um, obviously he became aware of my work, but also there is a connection there between um, Gia and Spike, right? Um, mm -hmm. um, because that's her uncle. Yeah, Spike Jones, of course. Yeah, yeah, that's her uncle. Um, and he was looking for someone to shoot a music video. Like, obviously, I was available and dying to work with him, but we had a little phone call just to get to know each other and talk for a bit. And obviously, it went great, and I enjoyed talking to him. And then I got the call that he, you know, I was going to shoot it, or that, you know, just more specifics on it. So we went and scouted it, and... He's just a fun person to be around, but also to work with. It just has an amazing presence on set and knows what he likes, wants your opinion. But yeah, just great ideas and so much fun. So we ended up not shooting that music video. I guess I stayed on his radar. So then when these things, these projects came up, I think Aziz was the first one to come up. He asked if I was available and then I said, obviously, yeah. And that was the first one that we did. And they were kind of back to back. So we knocked out the Aziz one, which is amazing because I shot on film. And, you know, he just, it's like these great ideas, right? It's like, you know, I'm coming to you with this great project, shooting Aziz's performance. Okay, great. And we're going to shoot on uh, Super 16. And it's a live show. And we're having multiple cameras. And we did a little test shoot, which uh, he always impresses me because he's a great operator as well. And we shot a small stage show that Aziz did in Manhattan Beach just as a test to see how the lenses and angles and stuff. And I operated one camera and Spike operated another. So it was Spike and I operating this live show in Manhattan Beach. And it must have been like a 45 minute or an hour show. And that camera stayed on our backs for that whole time. And, you know, it's just like the whole time, you know, if you feel uncomfortable, but you can't, you know, you have to stay in it. It's like game on and then Spike's over there too. And so that was really fun. Um, and I got to know like what he liked a lot about you know, different angles. And we looked at that. And then we obviously planned and shot the real show in, in Brooklyn. Um, but yeah, it's just amazing. I mean, he, he has so much energy, right? Um, and again, just like very specific about what he's after and what he wants from something and angles and um, lighting. Like we explored the lighting that Aziz would have on the stage and how he wanted that feel and the texture of it and stuff like that. So that experience was very fun. Um, and I think you know, besides being fun, I think it was impactful in that way, like culturally, right, to be able to do the Beastie Boys store and hang out with them. And, you know, Spike's obviously great friends with them. So I had a big smile on my face the whole time I was doing that job, for sure. It almost seems like the the trend in your life story here, as we're talking about this, is it's like, you know, how does Black Panther come along? Well, you do Loki. How does Beastie Boys come along? Well, you shoot a, a Z Ansari with Spike Jones. You cut you you uh, you start at one point and then you're doing exactly what I will tell you that quite often people will ask me, how do you move up in this industry or how do you do well? How do you get ahead? And 
I say that it doesn't matter what level you're at, what you're doing, you do a good job there. And if people like you, they generally want to repeat the process. They want to work with you again. They would said, hey, that was really good. How can we get this person back? And how can we do, do something together again? I, I think that you were like the, the perfect example of this as we're talking about this. It's like, you know, it wasn't your first time working with Marvel. wasn't your first time working with Spike Jones. You continues to level up and continue to work on, you know, bigger and, and more prestigious projects as time goes by. So what do you think about that? Is that would you feel like that's uh, that's sane advice for for people starting out? Yeah, I mean, you know, I always approached it from early on as like, I don't know what I'm doing right. It's like, I didn't know what a DP did. I had to look it up. I didn't have anyone in my family doing it. But I was so interested because I was so emotionally moved by f- films. And I loved watching films. And then when I did a little class and got to write about them, it was even like the door opened even wider because I was like, wow, the you know, besides just absorbing it when you watch it in a theater, there's just so many layers of like what the filmmaker is trying to do to tell you that you might not know. And, you know, it's so Im- there's so much involvement from so many people. So, you know, I always thought, OK, so I'm going to learn this. I'm going to figure it out and I'm going to be really good at it. And every chance I get to shoot something, I'm going to give it my all and, you know, put myself out there. Right. So I think by going to film school and doing all these little things like fashion films and music videos and So, so much work for free. Every chance, you know, you just hit the ground running and you put it out there so that you have a little stamp of yourself out there so that people, when they say, you know what, I have this job, like who do you have or who's interested? They can look up your work and actually see some type of version of who you are. It's not just another music video or this. It's like you're saying something with these visuals. And I still continue that in my career now because I I find that, you know, we're so used to looking at stuff like it's over... You know, there's so much to digest these days and it's it's a little easier to make things um, look good, right, with all the tools that we have. So, yeah, I agree with you that, like, you know, you want to do a great job, but you also maybe think about every opportunity as being your last and put put your all into it. So you have that last project to show who you are, really. I, I want to talk a little bit more about your life because you also happen to be married to a cinematographer. How does that work? Are you guys ever competing for the same jobs? I mean, I, now granted, I know you guys are going to be able to understand the rigors of the job because let me tell you, it's like if there is one member in a relationship that does not work in the industry, they they might have a really hard time understanding the hours and commitment and all the other sort of things that suck in your life. But now when you have two people in both who work in the industry and then have to juggle, like, uh, I, I assume maybe you have children or maybe a child, maybe you know how difficult this can be. How do how does it work with having your spouse do the same, ostensibly the same job that you do in this business? Yeah, I mean, it. there's there's always pros and cons, I would say, right, with any career, right, if you're doing the same thing as your significant other. And then it's just layered with more problems because we do have one son. And I think early on we met, and it's a funny story because this kind of ties into what you were saying before, is I shot a music video for Arcade Fire, a black and white music video that was shot in Haiti. You know, we shot this music video and it was the first time we used this black and white airy monochrome camera with the infrared filter. And it was very important for Khalil to get this camera. So this was his idea. He wanted this camera. They hadn't used it yet. I think they just shot a promo with some cars or or a car. And, you know, we would be the first to kind of use it in a, in, a, in a big project or a bigger project. And so we shot it. The video turned out amazing. It was a great experience, like flying to Haiti, you know, shooting these guys around the clock and their concert there and, um, you know, regimes from there. And so it was an amazing experience. And so I get a message in my inbox randomly from a DP named Adam Arkapa. And he was like, and I knew who he was because I had seen True Detective and I was a big fan of his work, not even knowing him. Which is amazing. Yeah, it's right. amazing. Yeah, exactly. totally amazing. So I was like, why is the True Detective DP emailing me? Like, this is insane. And he was so like... He, what, was he emailing you to ask you out? Well, no. So he was <laughs> not at all. He was messaging me. And for some reason, he tells me now that because when he searched my name, the first thing that came up wasn't like my website or whatever. It was twi- like my Twitter, which I barely use. And so he messaged me on Twitter. And he said, hey, I'm at Erie CSC in New York and they're showing us or DPs this footage that you shot and the video hadn't come out yet. Right. So they're like, we've seen this footage. And he was like, it's amazing. And I just wanted to say great work. And, you know, he didn't know me from he didn't know who I was. 
And then I was like, holy shit. So then I emailed him back and I said, that's amazing. I know who you are. And we actually have a mutual friend, who's Nash Egerton, who's from Australia and who had always told me, you need to meet my friend Adam. He's doing great work. So I said, oh, hey, our friend said we should meet and congrats on your amazing work. And that's how it all started. And we were friends for a while. And then the rest is history. But um, yeah, I mean, it's always, I think because he met me, I think before Palo Alto came out, I was still, you know, and he had some pretty groundbreaking work already. So it was a little easier to kind of travel around together at the time because mine were short, right? Now I'm doing projects that last over a year. <laughs> so, so the times had changed and they changed pretty quickly, right? So after I got Loki, then this. So I'd say there was a, a quick acceleration of my career and putting me in the same little bracket because he had did Assassin's Creed and obviously I hadn't done anything at that level until Loki. So now, yes, we're on the same level now as far as things that we're taking in length and budget, which does make it very hard to have a relationship because they're longer and we have a, a child. But you try and embrace it all and you never have the right answers, but you do your best. I, I think that's all you can do. And what's the friendly competition or ability to coordinate your lives like? Because I got to imagine that when you're talking about shows of the size of Loki and True Detective and Assassin's Creed and, and stuff like that, these are big, major freight trains that don't move exactly easily. And so you got to have that work life counterbalance where you just like you try to really, really enjoy all your time off together. Or do you do you all try to go on location or how, how do you how do you try to balance any of that? Yeah, no, it's, I like that you ask these questions because I try when I do my talks to to cover this stuff because I think, you know, you can look at this, this career as being very glamorous, right? It's like we're getting paid to shoot a movie with all these great people and actors and travel all over the world. And, you know, there's there also is the element of like being able to have a family and keep a consistency if you decide to have children and where do your children go to school and how do you keep in touch with your family and their family? So I think it's important to talk about this stuff because there is that element that affects your career, number one, and also being a woman, you know, having children, taking breaks, raising those children. And so it's very important to ask these questions too, and not only the uh, technical stuff. And so I, I say to that, it's really, I mean, it's a balance. Like Adam's had a beautiful career or he obviously, you know, still does films, but he definitely, there was more consideration to projects that he's taking now that he has a son, right? And uh, myself as well. So I had been offered, you know, series prior to Loki, but I wasn't able to do that. I, w I didn't say yes to them because I wanted to be around when my son was, you know, just born. And so did Adam. So I think that was important for us because we were very excited about having children, but also just being there. So there were things that he and I turned down, you know, after he was born. And then Loki came up and it was the right time. Um, but yeah, things come up that now for sure, I'm sure we're both on the list. And in the past, things have come up for him where I have not been on that list and have wished to be on those lists, right? You know, and, and worked very hard to kind of get my work out there so I could be a part of that conversation. So yeah, I think it's definitely more prominent now um, because I have had work that a lot of people have seen. So it's lovely. And yes, there have been times where I have said, I can't do this. Can you go to the tech scout and tech? And this is commercials. Can you tech scout it for me? Um, and then I'll, I can do the shoot. So I think it twice, that's been great, right? Where you can say to your husband, like, can you cover me? Right. And it's actually someone that's helping you out. Um, it's your family. So, so and yeah, someone who know, knows your style, knows, exactly. knows you know, know, knows what's important. Uh, have you guys done a first, second unit, anything together? Have you guys ever done a commercial or something where, you know, a camera, V camera, or a yeah. first unit, second unit, or something well, else? Well, when we first met and we first started to kind of, you know, get to know each other, he or we're dating, he asked me to visit him in New Zealand when he was shooting Life Between the Oceans with Derek C. in front. So I was there visiting him um, after I wrapped a movie, a little movie called One and Two with actually Timothy Chalamet. It was like one of his first movies that he led. So I wrapped that and then I visited him in New Zealand. And I was just visiting and, I, you know, they had already been shooting for a bit. And him and the producers said, you know what, we should ask, get Autumn to do second unit. And he's like, are you OK with that? Like, you know, instead of maybe me sitting around in an apartment waiting for him to get off work and, you know, exploring around the, by myself. I said, uh, OK, sure. Um, and I loved working with Derek. Obviously, I was a big fan of his film. So it was just fun to be around and see him work and then also do second unit. So I did second unit on that film for him, um, but also because it more not accident, but I was there visiting 
And then that's the last time. And I did some splinter form <laughs> on Assassin's Creed because I was pregnant. And besides just wanting to get cool pictures of me doing his splinter unit pregnant with our son, I think, you know, he wanted to get me out of the house a little bit too. Um, but yeah, that was only in the early days. And then after that, yeah, no more. <laughs> so so when you're like sitting around the, the dinner table, are you guys talking about like negative fill and bounce and what, what are you yeah. doing does, does work come home with you is, um, is we're that, definitely is not talking about that um <laughs> but yeah i mean you know you the same in as in any relationship you bring home stories from your day you bring home stories from setups and rigs that you did but yeah we have had some times where we've nerded out not any like any time recently maybe or when I saw Assassins, I was very interested in some of those sequences. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to play this. Tell me how you guys did this. Um, and that was fun because I think in that movie, they tried to do as much in camera as possible. And I, I enjoyed watching. I visited them in Malta when they shot that. So that was fun. So I, I remember asking him like, okay, walk me through this stuff, like a little podcast. Malta is a beautiful place and, and very popular for shooting these days. So, uh, yeah. You mentioned commercials. I talk to some DPs. Commercials is what they're all about. They want to do commercials. The commitment is short. They come in, they, they move out. They usually pay quite well. How, how, do, how do you feel about commercials and in, in comparison with like the longer form work that you do? Yeah, I mean, I've been fortunate enough. I think it's it, you have a very full career if you're not just doing one format, right? And it's really just like how it supports your overall filmmaking language when you are doing your narrative work, which is your biggest work, right? And because I started out in music videos and fashion films, and then obviously fortunate enough to play in the commercial game and then in between features, because they always tend to like to book, you know, uh, DPs that also shoot narrative on even commercials. It's like, oh, I've seen that DP's film. I would like to get him or her for this commercial. So your narrative work really books you on commercials as well. And so I've gotten to play around a lot with different tools, just filmmaking techniques, meet new directors, right? That I ha you know, never knew that I'm friends with now that I continue to do commercials with that are very talented and do great storytelling in a short amount of time, right? And you can be a little bit more bold with certain things, which is nice. So I enjoy doing commercials a lot and I tend to work with the same directors um, in commercials, you know, when I'm not working um, on features. So they become really great friends and I enjoy, I, I enjoy it. Um, but another thing I think that's fun is that, you know, a lot of the commercial directors that you meet, they want to make features um, as well. So you talk about that, you know, on set too, like, you know, and, and they're obviously trying to get them made. And, you know, so it's all this community at the end of the day, even if they haven't done um, TV or, you know, more have done TV now. But, um, and then, you know, I think my work in commercials and music videos you know, Max Minghella, when we did Teen Spirit, he had seen my music videos. He he knew that I dabbled in that. And, you know, it was so much a part of what we were doing in that film. And so um, that stuff spoke to him. And obviously it was through a lot of that, my knowledge from previous stuff into that movie. So, yeah, I think it's important to not just do one thing. I think you're right. I, you know, we, we only have a little bit of time left and I want to get into Loki because like I already gushed at the beginning, uh, I, I love Loki. I, I've went back and rewatched some of the episodes to refresh my memory, uh, before this interview. And I, I watched the first one, the first episode from beginning to end. And I was struck this time watching it, which is something I didn't pay as much attention to, uh, the first time was the framing. And you do a lot of low angle looking up on all the characters all the time, like, like quite, quite traditionally, you know, low angle shots, low angle framing uh, where you're looking up at characters. It's it gives a sense of power uh, or diminished power, depending on, on how close to eye level or maybe above eye level looking down. But everyone in that first episode, almost all the shots, it feels like it's a very like you're scraping the floor a lot of the time. Can you talk about a little bit about the framing? And I, I'm sure it wasn't just because of the incredible production design always above the actors heads but tell me about where this framing choice came from yeah i mean um i'm partial to this type of framing i think i was able to do it more aggressively in that project um it was embraced which was great yeah i don't know it it speaks to me being lower on the highlight i tend to like seeing ceilings versus floors i feel like you know you have opportunity to get into someone's eyes when you're lower but you also can say something um you know, with the camera being lower as much as you can say something with the camera being aggressively high, right? Which is what, you know, maybe is more what you see more often. And 
I've always loved Fincher films. And I think in some of his films, he does this type of framing um, in Seven, which I appreciate. And so that was also a huge reference for us. So, you know, in my earlier work, I just, I tend to do certain films with uh, female protagonists that are very young. And I think when you have, you know, young, beautiful young women and I'm following them around and framing them, you can be at all different angles. So on this project, more so than anyone, uh, any any project I've done is, you know, I had a chance to kind of aggressively do that because it was like this mystery they're trying to solve, but also this buddy-buddy kind of film where you have these two people playing off each other a lot um, in two shots and in talking sequences where you have them at desks and in longer conversations. And it just appealed to me to kind of, you know, have the desk in the foreground and to see the ceiling. And, you know, in talking to Kazra, he had seen my previous work and he knew that I like to be lower on the eye line. So as a team director, production designer, um, we all thought to have ceilings, which was big for Marvel to get because ceilings are very expensive. Also, they're not easy to construct and rig. And, you know, it changes how you're going to light things as well. Absolutely. So hiding lights. Uh, and are you mostly lighting then from the floor I, or you have a grid that's uh, above or behind camera? How do you approach, you know, having your ceiling in all your shots? Is is the pract- Are the practicals lighting the scene? How, how do you go about it? Yeah. So that's the thing. When you, I think what's so beautiful about the collaboration I had on Loki and then moving to Panther, I have always wanted to be best friends with the designer. Um, that is so rewarding to me. And then obviously the bigger movies, you know, I said I had a great relationship with VFX. So I just, you know, I love collaborating with the team to make the image better, right? And as a DP, we have nothing without structure. Um, We have nothing without the set, you know. Um, We have nothing without the actors there with the costumes on that we can light beautifully. So it's such a huge collaboration, but it's also, you know, it means that you go out there, you talk to them about how you like to shoot, what you like to see, how you're going to cover the scene, what's important to you. So um, Kazra is so brilliant, you know, and he's a great collaborator. And, you know, I'd just be walking down to his office all the time because it was such a fun space that they had there with all their stuff laid out, colors and textures and stuff. And we just talk, you know, we talk through the script. We talk about what he was doing, what, he, you know, he showed me his illustrations, um, his ideas and ask for my opinion. Do you need an extra light here? Or, you know, do you want lights on the shelves or how should we have the bookcases lit? You know, it was just always a discussion so that we could come up with a space that actually was full, right? As much as we could in camera, but also full with the with as much lighting that could be motivated as a, from a real source. So when he's designing chrono monitoring, or the um, time theater, you know, he's building, he's motivating the light for you in these great illustrations. So when I'm handed the time theater illustration, it's this beautiful, brutalist structure with this light streaming down and it already has, you know, texture, like there's haze in the illustration. And so it's like, great, this is amazing. This is what I would motivate as the source and it would bounce off the tile and create this warm edge. And then I had the idea because I was the new Blade Runner, you know, Deacons was moving the lights around. And so I was like, oh, well, what if we move, put those lights and we move them so that they could slowly move during the scene. And then that's working with my team to rig them so they could move, you know, all in one and just add this extra layer. So it's just a beautiful collaboration of all this discussion of how to do that. So, you know, in some of those sets, yes, all the lights being motivated from some of the practical bulbs that you see in the waiting room, this Miss Minutes waiting room there. Otherwise, we're hanging our soft boxes above the ceilings. So we're still doing all of our rigs, but they're above the ceiling. But the ceiling's being designed in a way that our light can come through and be, um, you know, shaped. And of course, you're talking about Kazra Farahani, and uh, he won the Art Directors Guild uh, for for Loki for 2022, which is, uh, and it, he has a whole team working with him. But it is, it's incredible, incredible production design. It's, in, it's, a, it's, he's a conceptual artist. And if you look at his IMDb, you'll see all the, the anyone who's listening to the sound of my voice can see all the incredible concept illustration, concept art that he's done for uh, incredible movies and, and series uh, over the, the years, including a, a project that I was involved a little bit in uh, many years ago called Alice in Wonderland. So ah, uh, but yeah, okay. his, his stuff is, yeah. uh, is, is well, that's really amazing. The thing. So. When you start working with him and you look into his background, yeah, he's so talented, but it, you know, you see what he's done and why his illustrations are great. You know, he used to do those illustrations and 
he understands the sets and how DPs like to shoot them or what they're after. So it's, it was really rewarding and to be able to shoot those on a large scale is, is pretty great. So I, I love that collaboration. It's my favorite, to be honest. Now VFX too, but um, it's always been with the designer. I love working with the designer. And, and that production design of Loki is just so incredible and, and so strong. Uh, we're just about out of time, but I want to say this has been such a delight. It's been so much fun to chat with you. If people want to get more of you in their life, and of course they can go watch your movies and commercials and music videos and stuff like that, but do you have a website or an Instagram? Do you use social media? Do you, do you do any of that stuff? Yeah, no, I do. Um, I've always, uh, the funny that you mentioned that because I feel like before I did Loki, you know, I, you, you have interaction from the last film that you did, so Teen Spirit or so. But after Loki, as far as Instagram, just being able to get direct responses from your audiences and to tell you how meaningful they these projects were and, you know, to give you notes and stuff was so rewarding, right? Because people were seeing it and then now with Panther. So yeah, I, I have an Instagram and I also have a website and I very much like seeing what people think. Um, and I think it's very touching. It's the same reason why I got into this, right? But back then we didn't have Instagrams, so I couldn't Instagram Conrad Hall. But yeah, <laughs> that's very, that's very true. Uh, well, well, Autumn, we're going to put links to your Instagram and to your website on our official website, which is camnoir.com. So anyone out there who wants to track down uh, Autumn, please go to our website and there will be all the links in the show notes. Hey, uh, thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. It was, you're very easy to talk to. So thank you. All right. So that was Autumn Durald Arkapa. Thank you so much for being on the show. It was so much fun. And uh, I can't wait to have you back and chat some more. I still haven't seen the new Black Panther and I'm, I'm dying to see it. Oh, my God. Well, you'll have a chance. I have a feeling. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like this movie might have legs. Yeah, a little bit. And now, short ends. So, Ben, it is our famed short end time of the show. Uh, what is your obsession this week? What are you what are you into? Well, I'm a little bit late to this party, and I'm trying to remember if it was your short end a few weeks ago, but I finally sat down and started watching Andor on Disney Plus in earnest, and this is one of the best things to ever come out of Star Wars. Like, It I, really I, is. It's, it's really good. It's so good. And I have to give shout outs to, there's four DPs on it, Adriano Goldman, Damian Garcia, Frank Lamb, and Mark Patton. Looks... Uh, Just amazing. And it's weird, though, because, you know, in the last few years, we've had The Mandalorian uh, shot by uh, originally by Greg Fraser, kind of a masterpiece. But this could not tonally be any more different. Like I was kind of noting to my wife that the Star Wars universe is kind of becoming like the DC cinematic universe where there doesn't really seem to be internal consistency. That doesn't seem to be, you know, like Marvel, everything feels like it's part of the same exact thing, but Andor does not feel like it's happening in the same universe as the Mandalorian or the book of Boba Fett or Obi-Wan. And and I don't necessarily think it's a bug. I think it might be a feature that they're basically allowing creators like Tony Gilroy to kind of run with a show like this. And Tony Gilroy famously, uh, not only did he write Rogue One, which this is all kind of a prequel to, but he sort of came in and redirected the third act, according to the stories, and kind of remolded that and made it what it is, which is also a pretty amazing piece of Star Wars. But this is like barely a science fiction story. It's so interesting in that like, yeah, it's sci-fi. There's some robots and rocket ships and the occasional ray gun, but it's really about these characters and you're way up in their lives and invested in them. And it's very, very deep and very smart and it looks great. And uh, if you're not watching this show, you're missing out. It's it's really just smarter than hell. They, they do a lot of stuff in it that that I'm giving nothing away here, but it's a heist caper. It's a jailbreak. It's it's all these yeah. different things. It's a, it's a different types of movies all wrapped into the series and and so much fun. Really is a lot of fun. To me, The Mandalorian is fun with like a capital F. Like it's a fun show. You got a 
Baby Yoda sure. and you got all this cool stuff going on. And this is not capital F fun, but it is still really, really fun. And it's edge of your seat fun. It's I mean, yeah, I had a few issues with that first episode. But once I got through the first episode, holy crap, for me, it was like it, it was just off to the races. I have to admit, it took me a few tries to get through the first episode. I tried watching it like three or four times. And I always thought that it was because I was watching it at the end of the day and it really needed my attention. And I just get sleepy and unfocused and so I was just having a hard time paying attention to it and the episodes are short they're not like hour long episodes so once I muscled through that first one and it's not that it's torture or bad or slow or anything it's just that it's not spoon feeding you the way that a lot of other shows would spoon feed you it's kind of dropping you into the action as it's already kind of happening but like once you get to the second and third episode there's some amazing sequences some just some beautiful stuff and I was wondering and still am wondering if they're using kind of that Greg Fraser developed uh, volume technology for a lot of the stuff because it doesn't look like it. Um, yeah, it, it doesn't feel like it quite the same. There very well may have been some, but it's it's different for sure. Uh, so, Ilya, what is your pet obsession of this week? Well, I didn't think I was going to like it, and I'm not the world's biggest Michael Mann fan. And mm. so when Tokyo Vice debuted on HBO Max, I, I kind of, you know, uh, I'm a bit of a Japanophile. I thought like, you know, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll get to this at some point. But then I found out actually that someone who we had on the show has been directing, actually directed about half the season as Joseph Kubota Vladika. And I was really, really big fan of his work for Catch the Fair One, which is such a great indie film. And I really enjoyed talking to him. I, I was like, you know what? I'm going to watch this. And holy crap, I'm only about a third of the way into the series, but I'm really liking it. And I can nice. definitely see the Michael Mann influences. It, and in fact, I got to say that it's different enough from Miami Vice. And it is sort of its own thing with maybe just like a hint of influence that I feel like if the series is successful, maybe this could become the franchise that Michael Mann, you know, maybe never intended. Maybe they could do, you know, uh, Bangkok Vice. Maybe they could do Paris oh. Vice. Maybe they could do, maybe they could make this go all over the world. So I, I'm telling people I know right now to give Tokyo Vice a try. It is really surprising and it's surprising in a good way. The story is about Jake Adelstein, who is one of the executive producers. And there's been some stories that have come out since this, since Saying like, well, how much of this is a true story? How really real is this? Because clearly it's a fictionalization. And even if it is not, not really real at all, maybe it is uh, only inspired by, I don't care. I'm really enjoying it. And Jake is actually relatively famous. I remember following his Twitter years ago because he was one of these people who really kind of busted the lid off of crime in, in Japan. A lot of people had this perspective that there's very little crime, but what it turns out is that there is crime crime going on, it's just really not well reported and certainly not well reported in English speaking press. And uh, he wrote a book called Tokyo Vice, which ultimately then I think kind of became the Bible for the series. Really enjoying it. And uh, shout outs to the other directors and cinematographers. There's four different cinematographers on this and all of it has been gorgeous and interesting and fun and I have to say that the lead who plays Jake Adelstein is uh, Ansel Elgort, and oh, yeah, uh, he's yeah. great. And he, I don't know how much time he spent. Baby uh, Driver. With a, he, he's amazing. Yeah, exactly. I don't know how much time he spent with a dialogue coach, but his uh, his Japanese is quite good. So I'm actually I'm, I'm pretty impressed at, how, uh, at the series so far. So, yeah, there you go. Tokyo Vice streaming on HBO Max. I'll have to check it out because I love Michael Mann. I think Michael Mann's stuff is uh, one of a kind. I won't say I've loved everything he ever did. I wasn't a big fan of Public Enemies, but, mm, uh, sure. you know, Manhunter, Heat, The Insider. There, there's so many Heat, really... Heat and Insider, I definitely... You, you've named a couple of my... Uh, if I had to pick Michael Mann's stuff, that's the, that's where I would go. But Well, you know. Manhunter is a very 80s feeling movie, but that is the first cinematic appearance of Hannibal Lecter. That's the movie based on Red Dragon. And it's interesting because Silence of the Lambs, which was the sequel to that, you know, comes out, I don't know, it's probably like six or seven years later from Jonathan Demme and a completely different take on it. And and Anthony Hopkins playing Hannibal Lecter. It was uh, Brian Cox the first time. And if you watch Manhunter, it's interesting to see that kind of story, but it really just feels like an action story. It's a straight up action thriller, whereas I would always argue that Silence of the Lambs is a horror movie. 
and can I say, can I get on a soapbox for two seconds, by the way, when we get <laughs> Michael into Man soapbox or yeah, no, when we get into the delineation about what is a horror movie and what is a thriller, I get very frustrated about it because mm. yeah, you could say that silence of the lambs doesn't have any uh, ghosts or werewolves or zombies in it. That doesn't mean it's not a horror movie because to me, horror is about the inexplicable. And the thing about silence of the lambs is it keeps one upping how inexplicable what is happening is to everyone around everybody. And that's just my opinion. I'm just on a soapbox. But to me, that's what differentiates Manhunter, which to me is a police procedural done really, really well. It's Michael Mann circa Miami Vice. It holds up and it doesn't hold up. It definitely feels like a snapshot of its time style wise. For sure. But Heat, oh my God, Heat is just like, that's one of those movies that I feel like you could just pick up and watch anytime it's probably the kind of movie that you know your kids will be like yeah that's an that's a movie for old men and they're not wrong but it's so just so freaking well done yeah it's a neoclassic i think you could yeah. you could make the case yeah uh well hey ben thanks for for jumping on a soapbox during my short end i, I appreciate that that's good no problem <laughs> so ben i think that just about does it for this show where can people find you they want to track you down find me at benrock.com And uh, I have been experimenting with, I I won't say I've left Twitter, but you can find me on Mastodon and Hive. I'm not saying that I'm going to leave Twitter because Elon Musk is coddling fascists, but (laughs) I I am going to say I'm experimenting with Mastodon and Hive because Elon Musk is coddling fascists. (laughs) And uh, I'm kind of liking those. So they're not bad. But yeah, go to benrock.com. You can find all my socials, although I don't think I have Mastodon or Hive on there. And um, LinkedIn, all that good stuff. And also uh, Midjourney came out with version four. And uh, I've I've been posting a lot of stuff from there. Uh, Version four is freaky good. So Ilya, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me over at Hot Rod Cameras, hotrodcameras.com. And also, if you happen to be in Los Angeles, uh, December 6, 2022, it's a Tuesday, Hot Rod Cameras is having our customer appreciation shindig. And uh, mm-hmm. everyone is welcome. We're going to give away thousands of dollars in uh, gear prizes. And then uh, there's a gourmet food truck that's amazing and an incredible uh, drinks and coffee bar and all that sort of stuff. And it's an indoor outdoor event with a limited number of tickets. So if you hear this and you want to go, feel free to go to our event by bright page you'll find us uh hot ride cameras there's only one and make sure you get a ticket because we expect it will sell out we're limiting the number of tickets because we want to make a a healthy environment for everyone and just packing people into the rafters isn't our idea of a good time so we're gonna (laughs) gonna limit it it'll it'll, it'll be fine anyway so so ben let's thank some people Who, who do we have to thank this week Uh, Well, first and foremost, we should thank Alana Cody, who's uh, gotten us some amazing interviews. And we have some really kick-ass interviews coming up very soon. So uh, thank you, Alana. We should, as always, thank Ben Katz, whose job we made extra hard today. Ben, thank you for editing this and uh, making us not sound like idiots. And last but never least, we should thank Kays Alatracci, who composed every scrap of music you heard on this podcast. If you like any of the music or just like music, go to musicbykays.com. Check out some of his work and uh, leave him a message about literally anything. Just say something. Uh, As long as you mention that you heard him on the Cinematography Podcast, our job is done. (laughs) I think that sounds uh, perfect, Ben. You want to take us out? Thanks for listening. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.